All right. Well, we're going to get into the pages of God's Word this morning, talking about broken together. And uh, from Genesis chapter 2, we're in this study. Today, we're going in Genesis chapter 2. And uh, somehow, we've, we've developed this idea that if you marry the right person, your marriage will be easy. I don't know whoever developed that idea, but that's the wrong idea. Uh, there's nothing that when it comes to the idea that you just marry the right person and everything is going to be a Cinderella story and everything's going to fall into place, it just doesn't happen that way. Um, thank God for our homes, our marriages, and our relationships. But marriage, home, and relationships are something that we have to work at to daily improve. And uh, in this new study that we began last Sunday, we're examining this thing and we're using the theme, Casting Crowns did a song several years ago called Broken Together. And it's pretty much taken from that particular song. We're looking inside the home. We're looking inside the marriage. We're looking inside relationships to see if they match up with what God's design is accordingly as his word tells us and uh, gives us direction. You know, it's amazing how God's word is applicable to every area of our living, just not to get you saved. Many people think, well, the Bible is just to get you into the family of God to make you adopted into family, the family like we saw on the uh, video clip here a moment ago. But there's more to the Word of God than just adopting you into the family of God by the process of salvation. It's also your guide for living. It's your guide for your family. It's your guide individually. It's your guide for the church. It's everything that we need in life. It's found in the pages of God's Word. So uh, it seems from the Bible that Jesus loved weddings. I don't know if you've ever caught that, but if you've read anything pertaining to the Gospels, you probably already know that idea that Jesus... Uh, going to a wedding and actually Jesus chose to begin his ministry in a wedding in Cana of Galilee that's where the place where he turned the water into wine and he performed a tremendous miracle first miracle that he performed actually and I want to share with you a strong profound word today from a great pulpiteer that goes back a few years his name is Charles Haddon Spurgeon Spurgeon said this marriage was the last relic of paradise left among men, and Jesus hasted to honor it with his first miracle. Jesus comes to a marriage and gives his blessing there. Then listen to the rest of what Spurgeon said, that we may know our family life is under his care. And isn't it encouraging to know that our family life can be under the care of Almighty God? Thank the Lord, our families, they rest in the hands of God. Now, that does not mean that we will not have trials and challenges in our life, which is all a part of our living, but it means that God protects and provides and defends and takes care of his children. Um, I don't know how any marriage could survive that, that this wasn't the case. And many marriages don't survive, and that's the reason for it. We don't anchor our homes on God in his word. And therefore, that's why we have all the turbulence I mean, that tornado that hit Central Virginia last week, a lot of homes have those every day, but in a different capacity. However, tragedy, I fear we have, tragically, I fear that we have significantly uh, diminished the permanency intended to be in a wedding. This, we're living in a crazy world. We're living in a crazy life scenario. Statistics say is this, one out of two marriages end in divorce. That's pretty significant. One out of two. And in that world that we're living in that's just inundated with craziness, these are some of the things, and this is actual, this is not made up, this is a factual fact. Some lawyers are, are advocating what is called marriage leases. You actually have a marriage lease. And when the lease runs up, your marriage runs up, runs out. They actually, you sign a document with a marriage lease in the relationship. Also, there's another process that lawyers advocate. I'll probably get some emails or something from lawyers. That's all right. Uh, they shouldn't be doing this stupid stuff. Also, there are marriage contracts. After five years, it re expires if you don't renew it. Now, that sounds pretty profound and pretty 
unbelievable and crazy, but this is actually happening. Couples actually sign marriage contracts, and they also sign under leases uh, pertaining to their relationship. You know, it's hard to pledge until death do us part when we're trying to figure out ways to get our stuff back before we even get started. I'm serious. Fighting over stuff, fighting over things, and many people spend and expend all their energy planning for their wedding day, but there's no plan for the marriage that will last that, of course, honors God. Marriage has to be worked at, doesn't it? Those of you who have been married a few years, you know what I'm talking about. The wedding day has never been intended to be a destination. It doesn't end on the wedding day. It begins on the wedding day. The wedding as designed, and you've got to look at the pages of God's Word and understand the wedding as designed by God was always the launching pad for the glory, uh, for His glory through a lifetime. And it can work if we will simply just try and let God do His hand of work in our lives. So we will benefit from God's gracious patience in marriage if we will take time to permit Him to speak to us. But we're so consumed with so many things that's happening in and around us we totally miss the point. There are a magn- there's a magnitude of distractions in the world today to keep us from focusing on what we need to focus on. So the fact is, if you look at it in the reality, we are all broken people. We're all broken people. So that being the case, what are you saying, preacher? We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Just because you get married doesn't mean that life is going to be wonderful forever. Uh, we were, <laughs> well, for some it got worse, didn't it? Yeah, I kind of caught the drift of that one. Amen. Uh, we, were, we were broken before marriage, and we we're broken after marriage too. So the only difference is now you're broken together. <laughs> I'm not talking about your finances are broken. Maybe they are too. I'm talking about being broke. I'm talking about your life is broken. And if you don't have Christ in your life, you are broken. But I'm glad there's a Savior that can put your life back together. I'm glad there's a Savior that can put your relationship, your home, back together. There's a God who's bigger than whatever we face. The only solution that we have, I'm going to tell you, if you're struggling in life, I don't care in any capacity, whatever it may be, the only answer to your life is Almighty God in His Word. And you can claim God, but if you ignore the Word, it's not going to do you any good. God comes with the Word, and the Word comes with God. So therefore, you've got to involve the Word of God in everything that you're doing. i got three foundational practices for you this morning over the next couple minutes, and i got to go quick because i got a long ways to go. You have to appreciate the presence of your differences today. Now, you know, men and women are different. And, uh, and we, we've got to learn to appreciate those differences if we're going to thrive as married couples. Um, I'm just not talking about the physical difference. I'm talking about there we come from different backgrounds. We, you learn a lot of things after marriage that you didn't know before marriage. And there's a lot of things that uh, you have to learn through the process of marriage. Genesis 2 and 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Now, only when we think about a helper, when we grasp that thought, we think about maybe a menial task, somebody that helps as a, as a menial type person that any person could do. That's not the case here. That is not what God is reflecting in the Word. The word helper is not a degrading word in the Word of God. It is actually, it conveys someone that makes up the difference in the lack of another. So realizing then we all have areas of our lives that we lack in, don't we? We're not all of that in a bag of chips. I hate to bust your bubble this morning. You're not Superman and you're not Wonder Woman. So uh, let's take that and get that aside and realize who we are. We're broken people. The word or the concept when we use the word helper today is used consistently in the pages of God's word to describe God himself. And let me give you an example found in Psalm 121. 
Here's a good example, and there are other places too. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, hallelujah, which made heaven and earth. So he is a helper. Now, there are other scriptures today that records that idea. To be a helper is never a reflection upon weakness or mental uh, uh, assistance, a, a menial assistance, rather. The, the Bible often uses this process of this implication of help and what he does God then describes himself as meeting needs that we can't meet one of the names of God found in the Old Testament is Jehovah Jireh that is interpreted mean the and the Lord who supplies and helps what we can't supply and help for ourselves so a woman can be a helper to the man in this sense and, and gender is not a social construct here when You've you got to look at it in the context of God's Word. Contrary to the contemporary propaganda that we're seeing today, we're being inundated with, we are hearing that God did not make a generic Adam and God did not make a generic, a genetic, I'm sorry, um, a generic, genetic Eve. And that's, that is absolutely wrong. God made a man, God made a woman. So every cell that is within our bodies today is declared by our creator as being either male or female. Now listen to what I'm going to say here because this is a issue that we're dealing with in our society today that's totally distorted. We are not permitted to choose which sex God desires, decides that we are. If God said you're a male, you're a male. Now you can go out and change body parts. You cannot change, you cannot change your, your, your DNA. You cannot change the fact that you are still a man or a woman. So this whole idea today is totally wrong. It's abstract. It's, it's not in accordance with God, and it's not even in accordance with medical science today. So realizing that today, we are made for a purpose. God has a design for all of our lives in whatever capacity that we're in. You've got to come to the grips of that and understand that, and accept that, and th- thank God for that. So, you know, and God made the woman, the female, to complement and to compensate for what is lacking, all right, guys, get ready, for what is lacking in the man. I knew I'd get some amens on that one. <laughs> Two opposites, then, are put together in order to make a whole. Right. So, a man and a woman represent, by the way, we all have weaknesses, so let's, let's give that disclaimer also. A man and a woman represent two opposites, both of whom are lacking by themselves, but when they are put together, they become a whole. So we strengthen one another. Uh, the question then is asked, whole for what? <laughs> what are we made whole for? Well, God made men. God made women as opposites so they could become whole together. So realizing today, I'm glad God knew what he was doing. And understand today, we can exercise, and this is God's plan, we could exercise dominion over God's creation. That was the design. You go to the book of Genesis, the book of the beginning, and how many times have I told you in the last 18, uh, 12 months, whatever, if you can't get Genesis right, you can't get the rest of the Bible right. So God made a man, God made a woman for the purpose of ruling over his creation to bring him glory. And so when God has brought glory, then God brings good to us in that process. So God wanted Adam and Eve, here's what God wanted them to do, to build a civilization, to care for the earth that he made, and to pass then their faith from one generation to another, all to the glory of God. So you look at it in the true sense that it is in, It's very simplistic. How did we complicate and make this such a mess? Human beings can make the biggest mess out of things, (laughs) out of marriage, out of relationships, out of family, because we won't follow God's plan. And that's the problem with our society. The real crux of our society being in a position that it is in today is because of the problem that lies within the relationships of the family. That's why our society, our culture, is so weak and frail and falling apart. And why we're choosing things 
that have absolutely, that are contrary to the pages of God's word. Transgender is contrary to God's word. As I just told you, humanly speaking, genetically speaking, medically speaking, you cannot change the fact that you are male or that you are female. So why are we trying to change what God has created and made that is good? We will use it for his glory. Let's go to Genesis 2, 8, uh, 19 and 20. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would uh, call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. So Adam realized, I'm alone. And he said, I need help. Sure, I've got God. So sensing that Adam was alone, and this was not good, we go to Genesis 2 and 21, and it records what God did. Let's look at it, 21, 22. And so the Lord God calls, now listen to this very carefully, what God did here. And so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and, and closed up the flesh and stood thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, so we see now the process that has happened here. So God, as he has fashioned the man from the dust of the earth, now God formed the woman from the rib of the man named Adam, which she came from man because God made Adam in his image, from the dust of the earth, gave him the breath of life, right? So they, they live, note this now, they live as equals, but they are different from each other. One is a male, one is a female, one is a man, one is a woman. I was reading about Matthew Henry, which is one of my favorite uh, commentaries. Matthew Henry was very smart, very sharp on the scriptures. And I want to read you what Matthew Henry said. Matthew Henry said, she was not made from his head to top him. Yeah. Guys, I thought surely you'd have said amen to that. Or from his feet to be trampled by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arms to be protected and near his heart to love him. Now, those last two phrases, those first things, yeah, I can pick up on that real easy. But then I thought, I thought, Matthew Henry, how awesome what the words you just put before us. To say that we, that woman came from underneath the arm of man, and that was a protection element, and near the heart of man to love. Well, you know, in order to properly love, you got to have the love of God in your heart. So it's not good for man to be alone. He needs a helper to accomplish a task that God has given him. So God then did exactly what God did. The man and the woman are, listen to this, the man and the woman are to complement one another in order for their marriage to be successful. Amen. That means all men are lacking without women. <laughs> Boy, I knew I'd get some amens on that one. And the guy said, preacher, can we have a meeting after church? <laughs> but that also means, before you call a meeting, all women are lacking without the men. Amen. Finally, the guys wake up. Genesis 2 and 23. And Adam said, now, this, uh, now this, is, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. All right. So Adam is beginning to understand the magnitude of the gift that was given to him. Now, let me just give you a picture here, and I want you to get this. The, the wife given to the man is a gift. The man given to the wife is a gift. So both receive a gift. So in verse 23, Adam is saying, Eve is fully human. Eve is equal to him, but she is wonderfully different from him as well. So, how do we apply this to our modern situation in which we're living today? We're being taught by the Bible to appreciate the presence of difference within the marriage. So 
We see our differences today. This is what's happening in the world. We see our differences today as a liability. However, God intends for them to be a blessing. So your differences is not a liability. Your differences actually become an asset in your relationship. So God wants to compensate for your weakness by giving your spouse. Amen. A wife for the husband and a husband for the wife. So certainly there are physical differences. There are physical differences with us. There are also emotional differences with us. You know? And there's another one. There are spiritual differences with us. So when you put them together, the experience becomes fuller. The physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. So the difference between a man and a woman really manifests themselves in the difference, uh, differing responsibilities that God had for the husband and the wife. So the husband was created first, therefore, he's given authority. And he's also responsible for the wife. He's responsible for the family. Now let's look into that a little bit deeper. 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9 says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So God made the man first. So that is why... This is biblical. This is, this is what God says. Men are to lead their homes and to lead the church. So in that process of leading, we're going to look at that. God puts men in the place of authority. God puts men in the place of leadership because man, uh, man did not come from woman. Woman came from man. But on the, on the husband, the responsibility of leadership is placed. Now, understand that leadership today... We're seeing more ladies lead in the home than we're doing men. And there's that's, that's a reason for that, because men have slipped. They are not taking the responsibility. This is, this is a God-given responsibility. Amen. So on the wife, God's placed the responsibility to be a helper. So let's see what those things are. There's three things, meaning the wife is what? She compensates for the husband's weaknesses. The wife compensates for the husband's weaknesses. So, secondly, she compliments her husband by offering things to the relationship that he cannot offer. So, she is vitally important in that relationship in the home. Third thing, a wife assists her husband in appropriating uh, companionship and domesticating the earth. So, there God gives us specifically in these scriptures exactly the role of the wife. Both the husband and the wife have to be submissive. Both have to be submissive. The husband must be submissive to Christ. You can't rule your home right. You can't lead right if you're not submitted to the leadership of Christ in your life. So the husband must be the, the servant leader in the home. The wife is to be submissive to her husband as unto the Lord. So the question is, why is this so difficult? Why do we struggle with this? Well, Genesis 2, Adam and Eve did something. And here's the very issue of why we have problems. They fell into sin. And just because you got married doesn't mean you no longer sin. <laughs> and because of their disobedience, a curse then fell upon the marriage relationship as recorded in Genesis 3. Uh, you can read through and see the curse that fell not just on the earth, just not on the serpent, but also the woman now would have sorrow in, in childbearing, and the man would earn the living for his family by the sweat, not of his brow, of his face. So the, the, the harmonious roles that God intended has now been, been disrupted by the sin because Adam and Eve sinned in the presence of God. We need to understand today that sin desires to control you. And I'm telling you, there are many people in this world that are controlled by sin. There are many marriages today that are controlled by sin. And I'm going to tell you the end result of sin. It's called destruction. It will destroy you. It will destroy your relationship. It will destroy your home. It will destroy everything that you've got. Because of sin, we do not want to function in the role that God intended for us. That's why we got all this wacky stuff going on. That's why you turn on the television on ABC around, what, 11 o'clock? And this idiotic program that comes on called The View is trying to change the scope of the marriage and the home 
the best thing you can do for that is don't watch it. And all these other sitcom programs that destroy uh, the, the integrity of the home and the relationship of the home, I wouldn't give you a dime for them. I don't watch trash. I'm careful what I put in my mind. Now, now for the man, God never sanctioned you becoming. Listen, guys. You think, I'm the leader, man. I mean, you kind of hold your shoulders up and put your chest out and hold your chin straight, square. But I'm the man of the house. But that doesn't mean you're domineering. And it doesn't mean today you never lead in an unloving way because that's contrary to God's plan. Instead of leading the wife for a good, the husband, I know cases where husbands bully their wives with selfishness and insecurity. And if you're a bully, that's exactly what you are. You're selfish and you're insecure. And you need a good swift kick in the south end to wake you up. And if you don't know what that is, see me after church and I'll tell you. If you have to tell everybody you're the boss, then I'm going to tell you you're not the boss. I'm the boss of my home. No, you're not. Because you're not leading. So the, the unity in the, for the first couple is, to, is destroyed because they stop functioning in the role that God had created them to be. So the same thing happen, is happening today. Let me go to the second one real quick here. We have to acknowledge the price of our determination as well today. So if you want to remain married, it's going to take a lot of determination. To exit and leave a marriage is a, is a cheap way out. I realize sometimes things are not reconcilable. But let me tell you, if you'll work at it, possibly it is. You don't, you don't get married to plan to get divorced. And people do that. I can get out of it if I don't like it. And there's a price to be paid if we stay with the determination. It, it costs. So there are three commitments that must be made according to Genesis 2. Here's number one. If you're determined to stay married, you must put your relationship with your spouse above all other relationships. That means with the girls and that means with the guys. So you, your first responsibility is to your home. Not going out with the guys and going out with the gals. It, it's not about where you live, but it's about loyalty and it's about priority. You've got to be devoted to your home. You cannot put the wishes of your parents above the wishes and the opinions of your spouse. You didn't marry your parents. Don't go running home to mama, and that happens to men and women. Well, mama, what am I going to do? Mama don't know what to do because she can't straighten him out either. Well, she's married to. So why don't you call on God and let him give you the direction that you need? The time to, to parent your children is before they walk down the aisle. Put the right example before them. Secondly, you have to cling to your spouses no matter your feelings or your circumstances. So therefore, you can't be controlled by your circumstances nor your feelings. You've got to cling to your spouse. Sit down and talk. That little movie we saw last night was a good, a good example of that. They went through some troubled waters, but you know what? Ultimately, at the end... They did sit down and talk. You know, you just got to keep praying and trusting God, don't you? A covenant is a commitment to God as, as, as much as it is to one another. So it's a commitment that is binding you to cling to one another and to look to one another for better opinions and ideas and to work together. Our vows are not expressions. Our vows are expressions of commitment and not expressions of feelings. doesn't have anything to do with your feelings. And the third point is we have to find a greater intimacy with our spouse. So I'm not going to deal with that so much. Uh, that includes physical, emotional, and spiritual. Those three points that I gave you a moment ago. And here's the third point, and I'm through. We have to aspire the purity of our declaration together. Every marriage declares something. Every marriage does. So it's either declaring the glory of God or it's declaring the glory of the couple. So looking at this today, God always intends for the marriage to be a picture of Christ and his church. If you read Ephesians 5, the picture of the marriage relationship, God throws a church in there. And it talks about our relationship. So God always intended for marriage to be a picture of Christ 
and the relationship that he has with the church. So that being the case, we're the bride of Christ. He's the bride and groom. And he uses that phraseology or terminology. So does your marriage point others to Jesus? Does your marriage make a statement for the honor and the glory of the Lord? It should. As a born-again Christian, you sh your marriage should be declaring Jesus and what your life is all about. So husbands, are you the servant leader that God's called you to be accordingly as his word has dictated to us that demonstrates the way that Jesus loved his church? And I could go through a long list of things that Jesus gave and intended for his church. We've got to incorporate those in our relationship in our home. Wives, are you a submissive helper that demonstrates to others how to follow Jesus without reservations? So our true love in marriage must be unconditional. You can't put conditions on it. It's got to be unconditional today. I mean, things happen. You don't love a person just because of their physical appearance. What happens when they get a little older? And <laughs> Well, you know the process, don't you? There's natural changes that take place. And all of a sudden, well, you're not as appealing as you were when I married you 30, 40, 50 years ago. Well, maybe you're not either. You didn't marry for looks. You married for love. Amen. So marriage is a reflection of the gospel. For we were sinful. We were flawed but we are more loved in Jesus. And you know how we're loved? We're loved unconditionally. He loves us in spite of us. So your marriage should declare God's love is an unconditional love today. For regardless of what we face, ladies and gentlemen, we face it together. And that is the life of a believer who is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you prioritize Jesus in your life, in your marriage, in your relationship, when you ultimately come to the place that you crown him king of your life, your marriage, and your home, your relationship is going to be a lot better. It doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. You're going to have them, but it means God gives you the grace to solve your problems together. And thank God that you can do that today. Thank God for the home. It is the first institution that God founded in the Bible. Not the church, the home. So we've got to improve our homes, but if we'll improve our relationship with God and with each other, we'll improve our relationship in our home. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, this morning for your mighty presence of grace and goodness to us. Thank you that, Lord, you never fail us. You are that helper. You come alongside of us and you lift us, you carry us, and you give us grace. I pray for our homes, our families, and our relationships that the mighty Spirit of God, Lord, will help us as we're broken together, Lord, to serve together and to love together and build our homes together. And Lord, see the glory of God rest upon our relationship and our marriage and our home and our children. I pray your blessings upon each one today in this sanctuary. Father, I pray that you will guard them and guide them. And Lord, keep them and bless them. And thank you today for you giving us relationship, not only to each other, but ultimately relationship with you, all in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and thank you. And all God's children said, amen. Praise God. Give that Lord a shout of praise. Amen.